Okay, and well, hi everybody. Um, Dr. Kogan, Center for Integrated Medicine, wonderful to be here. And today we have a, our special guest, Albert, Dr. Albert Garcia Romeo. He's from John Hopkins. And we've talked before, um, Al and I have a mutual passion to helping patients with cognitive decline, particularly Alzheimer's disease and also uh, psychedelic uh, medicines, particularly psychedelic mushrooms. So um, Al, together with his team at Hopkins, is doing a fascinating study looking into impact of psychedelic mushrooms on Alzheimer's disease. And uh, this is just a very brief video. Um, and primarily what we're trying to do is to see if uh, we can get enough recruitment. And the studies of this type are often not so easy to get patients in because they're strict cri inclusion criteria. So L, tell us a little bit about your study um, and uh, we'll start from there. Absolutely. And so just as you described, uh, there's been a lot of research over the last decade or, uh, or so looking at psilocybin specifically, which is found in these so-called magic mushrooms. Uh, so it's a naturally occurring psychedelic and a lot of converging evidence really seems to point to it being a safe and effective antidepressant medication. Uh, and what's really remarkable is that what, what's been found from labs all over the world in Switzerland and London and here in the US um, is that people with uh, depressive symptoms and major depression um, have one or two high doses of the drug with uh, su supportive counseling around that uh, and seem to have improvements in their mood that last months or even up to a year. And so, yeah, that's really exciting because it's a paradigm shift for the way that we treat mood disorders, certainly. Um, and it, it leaves a lot of open questions for how else we could use these types of treatments in a therapeutic setting. Um, and one of the big ones that you know we know, as you and I know, is a big problem, it's a growing problem, is um, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And unfortunately, that doesn't just come along with the memory problems and uh, the related dementia symptoms, but there's oftentimes other um, neuropsychiatric comorbidities, things that um, are pretty common, you know, up to maybe 40 or 50 percent of these folks are going to experience some level of depressed mood, apathy, agitation. Uh, and, you know, these symptoms detract from both patient quality of life and caregiver quality of life as well. And there are not a lot of effective treatments out there. Some of the data that we have suggests that regular antidepressants like SSRIs that are often used to treat depressive symptoms don't always work in patients with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And so for that reason, we're doing uh, what I believe to be the first study right now here at Johns Hopkins, um, where we're using a moderate and high dose psilocybin uh, with some supportive counseling uh, in people who have uh, early stage Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment diagnosis and some level of depressed mood that's bothersome to them. And uh, the way the study works really is that uh, we have people uh, fill out an online screening form, which could be found at our website, hopkinspsychedelic.org. And I'll make uh, sure that the links are down below. So don't worry if you didn't catch that. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure those links are, are uh, tagged in the video here. Um, but yeah, at our website, people can find out more information about the study, uh, but the basics are that um, we would typically have folks who seem eligible from their online screener to come in for a full in-person screening day here at the laboratory, which is in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and we would do things like a medical exam, blood draw, EKG, and uh, psychiatric history, just to make sure that they meet our inclusion and exclusion criteria and that it's safe for them to receive high dose psilocybin. Uh, if they then decide to enroll in the study, um, they would be coming back for uh, weekly virtual visits for about eight weeks, interspersed with a couple of dosing sessions that happen at the laboratory here at Bayview campus. Um, those typically last all day and are monitored by two trained staff. Often I'm one of those folks who are sitting in the room. Uh, and what we do is we administer first a moderate 15 milligram dose of psilocybin uh, to assess the impact on mood uh, quality of life and see how it's well, how well tolerated that is. And if it's tolerated well, then we move on to a second dosing session, which is about two weeks later. And then uh, we do the same thing, but typically would increase the dose to 25 milligrams, which is a higher dose that's uh, typically used in these types of antidepressant studies. 
Um, and from there, it's really kind of a monitoring uh, symptom progression and how people's mood is doing after those dosing sessions. So we'll continue to have follow-up meetings, including a, a few more in-person visits about one, three, and six months after the dosing sessions. And then we're doing a battery of assessments to look at how people's mood is, how their depression is, what their quality of life and anxiety symptoms look like. And so really what we're trying to do is just track if uh, the psilocybin dosing sessions seem to be helpful. Um, we're looking at biological markers, including things like uh, inflammatory markers in the blood. Uh, we'll be looking at um, uh, the microbiome um, related correlates, which include uh, things from stool samples, but the, the gut flora, which we know are associated with both depression and dementias. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately we'll be uh, even interviewing the caregivers or people who are close to the patients to find out if it's made any impact on their quality of life as well. So we're really trying to take an intensive approach here, learn as much as we can from a small amount of people who are uh, who are trying to recruit. Um, right now, the study has recruited, I believe, eight people, and we've uh, successfully administered psilocybin to, I believe, seven of them at this point, with some, uh, another one kind of slated to uh, have his dosing sessions later this month. And we're looking for about 12 more people. Um, you know, ideally, they would be in the Washington, D.C. or a Baltimore area just to uh, make logistics like travel easier, because we do require several in-person visits. Uh, but and this, and this visits are very long, right? So at least two of them are basically full day. Yeah, mo so there's about six in-person visits and they last between five to eight hours. And the five hours are like for screening. Um, the eight hour meetings are for the psilocybin dosing sessions where people are here all day. And then they typically are picked up by a family member or close friend uh, since they're not allowed to drive after receiving the psilocybin. But yeah, so we have those um, six in-person meetings kind of spaced out over the course of about six months. Uh, and um, a lot of the other visits are done virtually just uh, in front of a, a computer like we're doing now. And so that can uh, kind of facilitate uh, people who are not necessarily nearby. And we have taken folks who are from out of town before. So it's not a deal breaker for people who are interested. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, it's a significant commitment. I just want to make sure that everybody who is considering this is not naive about the fact that, you know, you, you have to participate in every aspect of this study. So you have to show up for everything. Um, so um, what what are the specifics in terms of who are you particularly looking? So you, when you, you we mentioned it's a minimal cognitive impairment and early Alzheimer's disease. Do you have any limits in age, anything or any other, any kind of issues that that would exclude someone right away yeah great question so i think the biggest one is yeah the age question is that we need people who are up to 85 years old so if you're 86 years old or older unfortunately they wouldn't be eligible at this time mm -hmm. um, we need people who have a diagnosis from their doctor of either mild cognitive impairment or early stage alzheimer's disease and also who have some level of depressed mood that's been bothersome to them um, and I think the main exclusionary criteria that people should note is that if they're currently taking some other type of antidepressant, um, you know, mainly the ones that are used are uh, things like SSRIs, but also MAOIs and others, um, we typically would not be able to take those folks um, while, while they're still on that medicine because uh, we don't want uh, to uh, risk any drug-drug interaction between the psilocybin and the antidepressant. Um, but some people um, you know, who have been on antidepressants or find them are not effective. They may talk to their doctors and then maybe decide to taper off and then apply for the study. So that's certainly a viable option. And if people and want so, to reach out. Right. And so this is a very common class of medication, things like citalopram, Lexapro, Zoloft, Paxil, et cetera. So there's a whole list of this medication. So if you're taking the, one of those pills, unfortunately, at the moment, you can't qualify. But again, as uh, Dr. Garcia Romeo said, that you can titrate them off or decrease the dose, discontinue, and then you'll become an eligible. Yeah, and of course, that would want to be done under the care of your physician or prescriber. Uh, not Don't just stop taking them because that can be unsafe. Um, and then, you know, the only other things that we uh, exclude for tend to be cardiovascular conditions, people with heart problems, because we don't want to um, create any uh, worse heart, heart problems with uh, high dose psilocybin, as well as people who have a history of uh, any sort of uh, psychotic disorder or bipolar mood. Uh, and again, the idea there being that we wouldn't want to exacerbate those conditions with this uh, psilocybin. 
Uh, this may come up a lot. Is the cancer current or past diagnosis is exclusion or, or is that okay? Um, I think that we are able to take people with past cancer um, in remission. And actually, let me take a quick look here, but I don't see anything here about current cancer being exclusionary, as a matter of fact. Okay. So um, if people have some form of cancer, you know, under control at the, at the time of the study that um, they ought to be able to apply and, you know, our doctors will do a really uh, thorough check to make sure that it would be safe for them to participate before we move forward. So I, I do want to make it clear to listeners. So, you know, you're you're not only getting the actual therapy, but you're getting a very comprehensive assessment here. So I feel in terms of the benefit for you, you get a, a, a very deep second look and, and you get all this information that can be then communicated back to your physician or your, your, your team of providers and can potentially benefit you, not just the future, of course. All the studies always look for benefit for the general public in the future. That's right, Dr. Kogan. I think, you know, one of the nice things is in the screening, if people are coming in, we're doing blood work, we're doing a, um, you know, a heart exam and a physical exam, and all of that uh, would be rec uh, records that we would be able to make available to um, people's physicians should they want to take those records. Um, and we also do that intensive mental health history and provide the supportive counseling along with the psilocybin. Um, but also, as you said, you know, it is a, quite a time commitment um, and uh, it's something that we're still testing to see if it works. So we can't really promise benefit that it's going to definitely improve mood or anything like that. But we think it will. Well, I mean, that's the hypothesis. For sure. <laughs> that's the hypothesis, right? Why else will we do this thing? Correct. Well, that, Dr. Garcia Romero, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, we have to come back about the microbiome part. I, oh yeah, definitely. I'm fascinated with this. We're actually just starting a, our own study locally at looking at doing the microbiome test for patients with minimal cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's, and then adjusting their diet based on the result. Just Fascinating. What happens. So, so I, uh, you and I will keep talking about this because I think microbiome and Alzheimer's definitely link. Uh, don't know how to manage that link yet, but I think one day we will have a lot more answers. Definitely. So we'll put a lot of things in the links uh, so people can find your team, that people can find us online screening intake forms. Um, and um, if anybody has any questions, send me a message and um, I'll try to facilitate it. Thank you so much for coming, for listening in. Uh, have a, have everybody have a good day. Thank you. Have a good one.